for those of you that are junkies or have been following Marcus or Impact or the Ask You Answer for a bit, um, some of this is going to be refresher and some of this could be new. For all of you who are like, what the heck is the Ask You Answer? Don't worry, I'm going to cover that. And really today we're talking about how do we in what nobody else wants to call a recession, I'm going to say the R word, like how do we still capture demand? How do we still grow? How do we still, quite frankly, thrive in what is at least a weird economy globally, right? So, so I have clients that are having their best years, their best months, and we have clients that are really struggling. And so I'm sure that everybody is somewhere on that spectrum. And the funny thing is that spectrum exists always, right? But how can we leverage some of these principles that are really customer-centric, buyer-centric in our businesses as we go? All right. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Dupre. I am Impact's Chief Strategy Officer, formerly the COO. Um, and a coach here at Impact, work with a handful of clients, taking them through sales and marketing stuff, all right? I, uh, I have a bad mouth at times, so if something uh, is just clearly needs to be uh, emphasized, just be prepared for that, because uh, that's just who you got today. Uh, and lastly, if you have any questions, there's a couple things you can do. One, you can just drop them in the chat. I've got some folks from my team that will capture those and make sure that they ask throughout the, the call. If you've got something specific where you're like, geez, I just want to have Chris answer this privately in some form or fashion, you can go ahead and drop a private message to me and I'll make sure that we capture those before I leave today. And then lastly, if you're ready to participate and you have something to say, go ahead and hit that raise your hand button in your reactions uh, tab, and we'll have a little dialogue. Ideally, I would love for somebody to challenge something that I say today. I would love for somebody to go, cool, 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 but how can I actually do this in my company um, or any of those types of things? So with that, and if, by the way, if all you want to do is like eat your lunch or breakfast or dinner, if you're in Europe um, and have your camera off, that's cool too. Uh, but let's talk about demand capture with the ask you answers we go into 2023. So one of my favorite questions to ask is always around what's changed with buyers since let's say the late nineties. Right. And, and one of the things I always go back to, and some of you will think that this, like some of you will smile and some of you will shake your head or some of you will say, what the heck is Circuit City, Chris? So, you know, think back to, I, I love that I'm getting some, Rhea, I'm digging the, uh, you know, digging the vibe. Same thing with you, Bora. All right. So 1997, I want to go buy a new television. What do I have to do? Well, I have to, yeah, I got, I got to walk or I got to, you know, drive my car to the big box store. Right. And I'm going to like circuit city or insert some other store, right. Walmart, um, whatever. And there's all these displays. And then I've probably, I, I just walk in and I'm bombarded by an army of salespeople. That is, hey, Chris, so, uh, or, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I'm, uh, what are you looking for today? It's like, I'm looking for a TV, I'm just buying. I'm just, I'm just looking today. That's like our net, like, and we all, like, tense up. We're like, hey, we're just, we're just looking. And you go look around, you see TV, but you don't have any way to get any information on it unless you go engaged one of those salespeople that, like, came all up on you to talk to you about whatever it is that you want, Right. That's how we got information in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? You had to get it from the salesperson. You physically had to go somewhere or some of the young folks won't get this, but you had to, they had this thing called the yellow pages that you opened up 
and it had all the businesses, right? And you had to, Josh, I'm looking at you. And you had to like sit there and make a phone call and talk to a human who would tell you something, right? It seems like, it's, it's like I'm talking about days before fire when we sit there and think about what we used to have to do to make a buying decision. Now let's fast forward to today. There are people on this call who have probably never walked into a store like Best Buy and engaged with a salesperson to purchase a television. There are probably people that have done all of their research on their iPhone and then hit buy now and used PayPal or Apple Pay or some other app that's integrated to just buy something without ever talking to a human, right? Those are the spectrum. That's the spectrum that we really have to think about today is back in the day, salespeople, they had all the power, baby. They knew everything. They're the only ones that knew it. Today, buyer knows pretty much everything that is humanly possible, right? They pretty much know everything that's humanly possible. So how do we, A, show up as businesses in this environment? And how do we make sure that we're the ones helping them make those decisions? That's part of what we're going to talk through as we go today. All right. So before we go into that, let's, you might be sitting there going, cool, Chris, you just gave us a TV scenario, but I'm a B to C or a B to G or a B to B to C to G to Q to whatever, however you do business. Here's the thing is it doesn't matter. Like, yes, a TV is a consumer type thing. But if we really get into who's making buying decisions as people, and if we go into what the number one reason deals are stalled today is, is it's not a lack of information. It's not, they don't want to change the status quo. It's indecision. People don't want to make purchasing mistakes, right? There's, there's a great book that, that if you're in sales or shoot, if you care about growth, it's called the jolt effect. It's by the guys that wrote the challenger sale. And it goes through this y'all. But it's this idea that indecision is killing salespeople right now. So consumer examples apply to B2B. They apply to B2G. They apply across the board. So it's just all get on that same page. So let's talk about us. Let's talk about us as consumers, whether it be buying stuff for your house and your family for yourself or buying stuff for your business, right? What is it that we want to know? Well, I, th I think we all have general things that we want to know. And because some of you all have cameras on, I'm just going to start calling you out a little bit. So let's see, Ken, could because of the smile, as soon as I said that, as thank you, by the way, thanks for coming and for being on camera and participating. So when you think about yourself as a buyer, and you're going to go make a purchase of something that I don't, I don't care what it is for your business, for yourself, whatever. What are the things that you want to know before you make, just give me one of the things you want to know before you go into a sales conversation. The one thing I want to know is, um, is there any kind of warranty? Yeah. Okay. We want to know if there's any kind of warranty. So why do you want to know that, Ken? Why do you want to know um, about the in, in case there's a problem with it? Or in case there's a problem with it. Right. Does it last? Right. I think everybody here can agree. We want to know is the thing that I'm going to buy is the service that I'm going to buy. Is it going to work? And what happens? What has the company done? If it doesn't work, right? These are all things we want to know. I love that. I love that. Let's see. Beth, give me, give me another. And thank you for, for being on. What's going on mute, Beth? So Beth, what's another thing is a buyer when you're making a decision, you want to know before you talk to sales. Um, mainly 
Like what's the price and what's the final price after every single thing that they've talked about? Because you know that they always have the big price posted and then all of a sudden it's like $500 more. All right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, we all want to know what things are going to cost. Yeah. Right, like we just do because who wants to get involved in a conversation with anybody to simply find out like maybe that 500 bucks is the difference between your ability to buy the thing or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we ever want to put ourselves in a position where we have to do that in front of another human? No. No, no I just want to do that. It's the same reason you don't ask what market rate is when you're out to dinner and they tell you that the fish is market rate, <laughs> right? You don't ask the price because if you don't get it, you're going to think, not everybody, but some people will think, oh, well, they're going to think that I'm cheap, right? That's why we don't do it. Now, it's also why, and I should do a study on this. There's a restaurant where I live that they tell you what the market rate is. I would bet you all of the seltzers in my fridge, and seltzers are a really high commodity for me. I would bet you all the seltzers in my fridge that they sell more of the fish than the guy across the street that says market rate and doesn't tell them the price, mm -hmm. right? Because I know what it's gonna cost so I can make the choice without having to feel weird talking to you about it, right? All right, let's get one more, let's get one more. Rhea, you've been smiling a bit. So tell me, other than what are the problems, what could go wrong and what does it cost? Give me one more thing that you wanna know as a buyer before you talk to sales. What else do I have to buy with it? What else do I have to buy? Will this work alone? Or is there a whole slew of stuff that I need? Right? And what does that help you understand? What am I getting into? Yeah. <laughs> what am I getting into? What's the real cost? Right? Like, like it's easy. Oh, you're going to buy this car. Well, you actually need the warranty. Oh, and the warranty actually is another $20,000. Like, so the real cost is the cost plus the $20,000 of the war. Now I just bought the biggest warranty in the world. I, I'm thinking, cause I think that's probably <laughs> the best example. Um, but this is, these are things, right? So we got a couple price related. We got one problems related. You're no different than your buyer. Right? There's a couple other things we want to know, right? Like, oh, I don't know. Who else does it? Who who do they who do they compete with? Who's better at this? Right? We want to know that. So I I'm a guitar player, and my teacher, this is probably a year ago, said, Hey, dude, you're actually getting pretty good. You should go get a re like a good, like you can go get a good guitar now because you're gonna be doing this for life. I was like, oh, cool. I didn't know what to buy. And so I went and I Googled Gibson versus Taylor versus Martin, right? Because those to me were the three major American brand acoustic guitars, right? And I ended up going with Gibson and several guitars later is the story. But, but the bottom line is I did verses, right? Like, so think about it. Could people be doing that to you going, ABC Corp versus XYZ Corp, right? These are things that we want to know. We also want to know who's the best. We also want to know ratings and reviews, right? We want to know how does it work? We want to know what it is. All these things we want to know as buyers. So the question becomes like, are we answering those same questions that we as consumers and buyers, business buyers have? Are we answering those on our website? Is it easy for people to search out those answers and get the and, and actually get what they want? Or are we living in 1997 where we want to be that 22-year-old kid that's working at Circuit City going, you know, hey Sandy. Uh, what, what, what brought you in today? Like, can I show you and tell you some stuff about this TV? Like, so if we're not educating people, that's where, that's who we are. If we want to personify ourselves as a business, we're that real annoying salesperson 
that's trying to tell us all about the TV. Right? And we all just agreed that we want to know what's it cost? And maybe, maybe we can't get to the exact price, but holy smokes, if I can't get a budget, I'm gone. Right? Right. Think about that. If you can't get to at least tell me about the budget for your thing, how long do you stay on somebody's website? My guess is uh, not long enough to fill out a form, right? The most infuriating thing in the whole world is done by a company that I love. Everybody's heard of Gong, right? Or, well, and, or you've heard of these platforms that record sales calls, transcribe and give you insights and all this stuff. I have clients that use Gong. I love it. It is the simplest platform in the whole world. And I still don't know what it costs because their pricing page leads me to talk to sales. And I'm just not going to do that because I shouldn't have to for a piece of software, right? Like I shouldn't have to. Now, you don't want to tell me how much it's going to be per seat. At least explain to me how the packages are formed and give me a budget. If you're X size company, you're going to be in this range. If you're Y size company, you know. But if you're the sales rep for Gong, you know, and I ask you, so talk to me about price, you're going to have an answer. So I want y'all thinking if today, you don't have an article that at a minimum talks about how you do pricing, how pricing is done in your industry that could help a buyer of your thing understand the potential investment they have to make. You need to ask yourself how long, like, would you take the next action to go talk to your sales team or would you go find another solution? Right? So I want everybody to think about that. I'm going to pause. Nick, do we have any questions that... I, so I can see all the stuff that's happening in the chat and um, I'm not paying attention to it because I'm talking to you all. So Nick, help me out. Is there anything that we need to address before we move? Oh, and we've got a hand raise. Leslie, bring in the heat. So let's go, uh, with, let's go Leslie first. I, I keep a sort of bringing up to my executive leadership and sales leadership they say, we don't want to put pricing on the website. I said, you know, there's a lost opportunity cost there because people are hitting that page and they're bouncing off because it's not there. And then they're going and looking at our competitors pricing. And then right. they're no longer on our webpage. Right. I would love to know if anyone has ever been able to calculate what that lost opportunity might look like, because I think that's something that they would pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, so the simplest... So the simplest way to specifically answer your question, Leslie, and it's a great question, is go with what's the average, you know, if you get a lead, like what's your close rate on the leads you get from your website? And, you know, what's your, so actually you got to start with what's sort of your session to contact rate. So what percentage of people actually convert? That's going to help you know maybe how many you've lost, right? And you're going to have a lot that's lost. But then you go to what's your close rate from inbound leads from your site? Yeah. And what's the average deal size? And so let's just use Dupre level math. Let's say that your close rate is 50%. And that, like, look, listen, I know. We're, doing, we're, doing infantry, we're doing infantryman <laughs> math. Okay. So your close rate's 50%. And your product costs a hundred dollars, okay. like, like like your service costs hundred. So, for every lead that comes in, it's a fifty dollar potential, right? Like because if half of them close, whatever. Sure. So for every one that bounces because of that, you potentially are losing fifty bucks. That would be a way that I would try to calculate that. Cool. Right? Great. Great answer. Now, now, Leslie, here's the bigger thing, though. There's convincing people, but the question becomes, do they actually know what they're disagreeing with? And here's why I say that. Marcus, Zach, Basner, uh, I think Will Schultz and I, 
we're all having, and Chris Marr, we're all, they're all coaches here at Impact. We're having this conversation exactly about what you're talking about, Leslie, of, you know, we have an owner that just doesn't want to talk about pricing. So how do we attack it? And all of us attacked it the way that you're going about it. And Marcus was just defiant. And it was the most frustrating role play I've ever done in my whole life. And so then we flipped the script and Marcus played the guy and Marcus asked us, so, so I'm going to pretend like you're Marcus, right? Or I'm asking you, Leslie, right. instead of saying, well, what's the potential loss for this? I go, Leslie, what's your understanding of a cost and price article? And what Marcus's role was playing was he thought that it meant putting all of our prices on the website to the nth degree and saying everything. Right. And there's a lot of business leaders out there that would never do that, right? Right. Because, because you could make arguments that it commoditizes. You could make arguments that if you have your price list, like there's no wiggle room. Cool. I'm not telling you to write about your exact price. Sure. Unless you have one of those things that can. So, so the question, Leslie, is do they know what they're saying no to? Right. And that's where I would start. And then if they totally get it, that's when you can come with some, you know, potentially with some logic to be like, y'all, we're leaving a boatload of cash on the table. I'm about halfway there. So that's the good news. <laughs> cool. cool, cool, cool. Well, good luck. Good luck with that. All right, Sandy, you're up. Then we're going to keep going. I tried the range approach of saying, hey, you know, we're just trying to get a range. And the, the feedback I get back with the pushback is, but then we're pigeonholing people, you know, and we don't want to pigeonhole people into they're going to have to fit into this what if their budget is a little over that or a little below that or that sort of thing yeah okay all right all right so i don't know what so what do you do sandy what, what's your company do i usually say people have their range and if you don't fit in their range they're going to go elsewhere and that's okay yeah yeah so so 100 100 true but i guess the thing that here's the thing if somebody was on the phone with your sales team and they said, so talk to me about how much this is going to cost, would your sales team answer the question? It's kind of hard because we have a layer. We don't deal directly with our, we are a manufacturing company. So okay. we have a rep layer and I don't always know how the rep is going to deal with it. My feeling is that if you're you know, just a little bit higher than what I'm looking for. I'm not necessarily going to go away if I'm interested enough, right? Um, but I'm not sure how they're currently dealing with with that. And that's one of the questions that I, I'm having a focus yeah. group with the reps to kind of figure out. But um, I guess- I would ask him that question. I would start I right there they, though. Yeah. Like, what would you say if the the organization, the person you sold to said, talk to me about price? what would you say? That's the starting point for these articles, right? So if you go back to the book, like how much does a fiberglass pool cost? Well, listen, it can cost anywhere from $50,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what you want to do, right? And so it's, I'm sure there are things that make the price go up and down, left and right, all this stuff. And so, so that, that's where I would start there, Sandy. And, uh, and we'll see what happens. Okay. All right, Bora, we're going to go to you, and then we're then we're going back into the rest of the stuff. What do you got, brother? Great. My my comment on that range, and and I understand that at the early point of a customer's buying journey, they got to know just kind of ballpark. But I've found that when I give a range, the decision makers hear the lower number, non-decision makers hear the higher number, and freak out. The decision makers take the lower number, they put it in their pocket mm -hmm. and they pull that out at the end when we're doing the final negotiation. They said, sure. wait a minute, where'd this $50,000 price tag came come from? Right. You told me that it was $10,000. Right. So that's a dangerous thing to do. How do you deal with that? I mean, I have my opinion, but I wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here's the thing. Let's separate two things really quickly. We have sales conversation. And we have article and video explaining this stuff on our website. Okay. Bora, I'm with you. Sales conversation, you have to be tight 
it can't be loose and everything that you said I've experienced myself now the thing that we have to do in this article this video so listen people have the question we have to address it it's how do we differentiate between what does the ten dollar thing what is that to the other side of the spectrum and we have to explain it in a way that people will actually understand it and this is the thing that i believe most of us don't do well when we first start writing these articles about 80 percent of that pricing article should be about pricing in the industry how the industry does this and about 20 percent is specifically about how y'all do it now that's for your public face that's that's your stuff you write a buyer's guide you're going to get more specific right your impact and we have packages we just say what they cost because because there's there's nothing that's going to make them change right so so that's that's the piece there but so cost and price we spent more time on it because it is what i have seen is the biggest hang up for folks to get moving is they're like hey we love this they ask you answer thing we're never talking about price and and you sit there and you go well you don't love this they ask you answer thing because if you did you'd go, my buyers care about this. So I have an obligation to educate them on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Avoiding, avoiding the uncomfortable conversations does not make a person a good salesperson. That's for Correct. sure. Correct. Correct. And so, so we've got that. Boom. Cost and price. Now we go into problems. This is the problem. This is the second most un misunderstood topic area because we usually go right to what are the problems that my products solve? That's not what we mean when we talk about problems articles, right gang? We're talking about, pro go back to what Ken said. What's the warranty? He wants to know, is it gonna break? And what's gonna happen? This is problems inherent in our industry. This is problems inherent with our product or service, right? So you take, you take let's just use a coaching company. One of the problems inherent with the coaching company is it's reliant on you as the buyer to do the work. Right? Like, I can't guarantee you anything. What's going to cause it to fail? You aren't going to do your things. Right? Well, if I don't say that, and then it doesn't work, and then I come back and tell you that after the fact, that's not going to be a healthy relationship. Right? It's just like, you know, nobody searches for what what goes well with the Mustang. Everybody searches what goes wrong. Or everybody that buys a BMW in the United States has to get the warranty on it because you know that you're going to take it in, right? But you, we've got to talk about these things because here's the deal is somebody's going to, and that somebody is likely not trying to help you gain business. That somebody is likely trying to gain business away from you or steal business away from you, right? So we've got to talk about these problems inherent in our industries. What could go wrong? Now, I want to leap very quickly to that book that I showed y'all, The Jolt Effect. If indecision is that number one thing that is stalling deals, and this is the craziest thing, is in their study of 2.5 million sales calls, 56% of the stalled deals were because of indecision. These are people that said, I, I, the status quo is broken. We need to change. I want your product. And then they didn't buy it. Okay. 56%. It's a lot. They're worried about what's going to go wrong. So if we are going to start combating that, we need to be openly talking about what could go wrong and then how we mitigate for that to take away that little piece of indecision that little piece that they could be hanging on to, okay? So as, as I think Marcus says in the book, you gotta be able to point to the big, you know, your elephant and say like, yeah, this is, this is a piece of our service, our product that, that isn't perfect. Then here's how we deal with it. All right, so that's, that's problems. Then we go into comparisons and verses. 
it's as simple as it sounds, right? People want to know Burger King or McDonald's. People want to know uh, Gibson versus Martin. People want to know Impact versus New Breed. People want to know ABC Corp versus JKL Corp, right? So if, if we know that people naturally compare, why aren't we writing those comparison articles? Right? And this is the pushback that we always get. Well, how do I, how do I, how do I write it? How, well, you know, my, my competitor, the person I'm comparing myself with is going to get upset. So the first thing that I tell people is, A, you're only, you're writing unbiased and you're only writing things that you know to be true. So you're going to find the stuff on websites, like from client experience, you're going to know the stuff. But at the end of the day, do you care what your competitor thinks or are you focused on your buyer and answering the question that they have? Right? Because if I want to know X or X versus Y, but you don't want to write about Y because you don't want to hurt Y's feelings, you have potentially lost me finding you. You've potentially lost me converting on your website. You have potentially have lost the opportunity to get to talk to me. Right? And some really cool things can happen when we get into comparisons. You could start ranking for your competitors' names in Google, and they people might find you in that article before they find the thing they were going for because you've openly addressed a question that people have. Right? So, so we always need to be talking about comparisons. That's a big one. Same thing with best of. Who are the top five? underwater basket weavers in New England, right? And we've got to rack and stack and rate them. There's some things that are key here. It's like, what are you comparing people on? What are you using as your criteria? Make all that known. And don't put yourself on the list. Now, some of you are sitting there going, I'm going to do a top five or top 10 of of people in my field that I'm not gonna put myself on the list. Chris, you're crazy. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And if you're thinking that that's okay, I've had like all my clients say that to my face. And then I remind them, if you're the one that rated them, where do you stand? Above the rating. If I'm the one answering, if I'm the one bringing the information forward, I'm, I'm, I'm heads, above it and oh by the way a second effect of this you do this well again that best of list could rank better than some of your competitors for their own name you know marcus tells a story in the book where somebody was looking for let's call it patriot pools and he did a best of list and she literally was like looking for their phone number and she got to this article on marcus's website and she ended up buying a pool for Marcus. When she and she told him, like, I was going to buy a pool from Patriot Pools. But that one article generated that demand or captured that demand, right? And the last thing's ratings and reviews. We all want to know how people have experienced our product, all these things. Right. So we call these the big five. For for those of you who are new to the ask, you answer those are the big five. For those of you that have been through it. Hopefully some of this has given you a little more insight into what those categories are. Now, this isn't in the book. There's two other topic areas. So we sort of at impact and when version three comes out, like I'm sure that they'll be in there, but it's the big five plus two. So what is, so if you're an underwater basket weaver, what is underwater basket weaving? Right, just think about your own search habits. You literally, if you don't know what something is, you might type in what is and then the thing, and then Google takes you to the first answer there, right? So what is our articles that, that we look at? And then how to, right? And again, I just want you going back to thinking about your own simplified process of how do you search for stuff, right? How to is a great YouTube one, right? Like all the time. So that's a big five plus two. 
Okay. This is this is the thing that just drives me insane. You all know the answers to all of these questions. You know cost and price information. You know, and by you, I mean your organization. You know cost and price. You know the problems with your industry. You know the problems with your service or product. Like you know it because you deal with it every day. You know the comparisons, whether it's product to product, whether it's competitor to competitor, you know that stuff. You know who's the best and you know what people are saying. You know what it is and you know how to do the thing. Why do we remain the 22 year old kid from 1997 at Circuit City that is like, I am gonna hold on to this and make you come to me and make you talk to me, why? That's the question. If you're not doing this, that's the question you all have to go ask yourselves. Why are we that annoying salesperson from the 90s when we know that that's not how society works anymore, right? So I remember growing up as a kid, my parents would argue about nothing. So my old man would be like, hey, what movie was that guy in? And my mother would like say something like, nah, you're wrong. And they they like playfully argue about who is in this thing. And they never got to a resolution unless they went to Blockbuster, which all you youngsters, again, that was a place that you rented videotapes and DVDs eventually. Um, like that's the only way to settle that score. Think about today. When was the last time you had some superficial little argument with a partner or a friend about who was in a movie, who was in the band, who wrote that song, who directed that. There's no, there's no room for that argument anymore. We all pick up this thing and we go right to Google, right? Like we all know it. So if we are stuck in 1997, in the blockbuster days, in the Circuit City days, that says something about our business, doesn't it? And so we've got to get ahead of this. Because, listen, I'm no economist, so take this as a dumb infantryman who now talks about sales and marketing. Things are going to get worse before they get better. That's just the natural flow of, the, of economies, right? Like, things go down. At some point we hit a floor and then they start going back up. You can do a couple things. You can run away or you can go right at the thing, which by the way is the safest place to be if a tree's falling is right near the base of where it's falling from, not running away from it. So we wanna run at the problem. And if we start addressing this stuff, we will come out of whatever this economic bullshit is better. It's exactly what happened to Marcus. It's exactly what's happened to numerous businesses over and over and over again. Those that are willing to do the things that consumers care about are the ones that are going to win, okay? There's other crazy stat that I, that I saw the other day, right? And if you've read the book, you've heard about the 70% zero moment of truth. Today, it's more like 80%. And this is people are generally, and again, industry agnostic, your industry might be a little different, but they're generally at 80% of their decision-making process before they reach out to you, before they want to talk to a human, right? So most people think that means sales has at least 20% of the influence on the sale, right? If 80% of the decisions made 20%, that makes, that makes sense. Like I can get the math, but we forget they're likely reaching out to three or four people, aren't they? Right? Unless you're a Gibson guitar buying guy, you probably also own a Fender. You probably also own an Epiphone. You probably also own whatever. Or at least you talk to people from those places. So do we really have 20% of salespeople or do we have a sliver of 20%? We have a sliver. Right? So what ever we can do to influence the previous 80% we need to focus on. And it starts y'all by answering those questions 
it starts with addressing the big five plus two and every other fear, worry, concern, or issue that your folks have. Because again, no matter the economic climate, people are still looking for your solution. People are still, you know, I don't know what industries we have here, but people need whatever you manufacture. People need the service that you provide. They need the software that you've built. So they are searching for those things or they're searching on how to fix problems that they've got. And so somebody is going to capture those people and have a chance to enter into a sales conversation with them. If you do this and you do it well, you are more prone to get more opportunities to talk to people than you are if you sit back and wait to talk to them. Okay. So this is about capturing that demand that's out there. People want your stuff. If you're the person answering their questions, you have a better opportunity to actually win their business. All right. So before we go into some questions, we know that people want these answers, y'all. Like we know it because we want those answers. So if you're not doing it, you got to think what's getting in our way from giving our buyers what they want. That's the big question to be asking yourselves as we leave here. But Nick, I know, I know the chat's been blowing up. So hit me with your best shot, brother. What do we got? Yeah, man, we got, I got one DM to me. It's not as much of a question, but I think it's important to answer it. Um, it says, this is great. And I think it makes sense, but there's literally no way my company will let me talk about my competitors and post price and all these other things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, I think it's, I think that's just a good place to go. But if anyone has any other questions, you can just DM to me directly. Or you can raise your hand. You can have a chat with Chris too. All right. So, so my company won't do any of this stuff. Funny thing is I engage in more conversations like that than I probably should admit to um, as we go. This is, this might sound too simplistic. And so, so don't, don't, don't hate on me for saying it. But the real thing we got to get to is like, what's the root cause there? Why? Like, because, because here's, here's the answer. They're afraid. And it's what is the fear? What is the actual basis for that? Because we cannot overcome it until we understand it. So I use the example that I used with Leslie about, you know, this price conversation we had. The whole thing wasn't actually about, we don't want to talk about budget. We don't want to talk about it. It's they thought we were talking about literally listing every line item that they offer all their SKUs in a price list, right? So is that the problem? Maybe, maybe not. The competitors thing, are they worried about blah, 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 blah. Well, we got to understand what they're worried about if we're going to have a real conversation to get past this. The biggest thing though, that I would come back to whomever sent that to Nick is A, have we gotten, you know, go give him a book. And, and listen, if you, because you sent that to Nick, tell Nick, give Nick your address and Nick will send you a copy if they ask you answer. And we'll, we'll write in a little note and you go give that to your CEO, your boss, your VP of whatever and have them read it and then have the conversation with them, right? But the end of the day, all these business owners, all these business leaders, they have all these fears. And when they read, they ask me answer, they hear someone like me talk about it. They've got resistance, but every single one of them wants to answer the buyer. Because none of you would survive without the buyer, whether it's a government entity, another business or a consumer, we don't, we don't, I can't keep doing, I can't do these sessions with all of y'all who are not, who are part of our impact community now 
if I don't have people that are willing to pay me to coach them, right? Like I can't do it. So if those people have questions, I've got to answer them because I got to take care of their concerns. You know, now if your business is thriving, if you're, if you are crushing goal and are at 50% net profit and life is good and you don't have to do any of this stuff. Awesome. I'm in the wrong business then. Right. But my guess is if they're afraid to talk about cost and price, if they're afraid to talk about competitors, you're likely commoditized and really probably struggling to, to have the years that they want. And it's much easier for us to go like this and to become the 22 year old salesperson from 1997 at Circuit City. Right. So, to whomever sent that in, I hope that that helps you. And by the way, know that you're not alone. Not the first time I've heard it at all. All right. What else we got, Nick? Yeah, this is a good one. This one's super timely, too. Um, so it says, Oh, Jason. Uh, you want to come up and you can ask Chris your question. Where'd you go? I lost you on my screen. Oh, I see him. Jason, let's just uh, unmute Jason. Hello, All my right, friend. So, so my question is, I, I like the approach. We're going to start rolling it out. But uh, do you think with uh, the advances in AI, things like uh, uh, chat GPT, that the content portion of it, the, the written portion of it, trust in the written portion will be eroded versus advancing into video and perhaps even audio type content. Obviously yeah. the, 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 the copy portion can help drive traffic, but do you think there'll be less trust in the written word with the advances of AI? It's a great question, man. Um, here, here's what I think. I think it's like, and again, I'm giving you the standard uh, coach answer. Like it depends, but let me, let me validate my, it depends. I think if you're in a saturated industry that there is a ton of adoption of some AI stuff and there's a ton of uh, copy being written, it could have that effect. I think the majority, and this is the craziest part, is the majority of companies still don't do this stuff. They don't actually answer the questions, right? And so, you know, you said a bunch of things, right? So the organic, like the writing is going to drive some organic traffic if we're doing it right. And then we're going to have video and all these other parts of the ask you answer on the site. Right. So, so that's going to be solid. But there's also folks like me that go into like the assignment selling portion. If I'm buying something, I love video. I'm a video first guy. I come across better in video than I do in written form. But if I'm making a buying decision, I want both. I want to read what your team has written. And I want to go watch the video because that's how I, I consume things. Like I'm still that, that weirdo that has real books, right? Like I know that I could just, pop in my earbuds and listen to this book at the gym, but I'm actually going to go sit in my, you know, chair in my office and actually probably get some paper cuts. Right. So, so I don't think it's going to be diluted. I think that we will see it change and how we leverage things, but it's still got a ways to go. Oh, for sure. And the thing that I want everybody to understand is like, y'all know those like uh those exercise things that are like you know strap it onto your belly and turn the button and it jiggles for a bit and you're gonna lose weight but y'all know what i'm not like those like little fads or whatever like we all know that none of that shit works right we all know that we've still got to go to the gym and eat well and exercise if we want to lose weight or stay fit if we go all in and forget about the human side of content creation, actually answering the questions, actually doing these things, it's all just going to turn into sitting on the couch, eating potato chips with that thing around your belly vibrating, thinking that you're going to get skinny, right? And so AI is going to be a great tool that helps us, 
but getting the questions, curating the content, understanding the priorities is still going to be a human thing because we're not selling to other machines. We're talking to people who are afraid of making the wrong decision. Right. So, so I still put a lot of weight into the content manager. I still put a lot of weight into their role and I don't see that changing in the next year or two. Great question though. I appreciate you. All right. What else, Nick? I think we got time for one more. I just want to make sure Martin has a question, uh, question in there and I don't think we addressed it unless I missed it. Oh yeah. What are the, what are the best channels to answer these questions? Oh, Martin, such a mistake. Such, such, such a great question. So it depends, um, right? Like, here's the thing. What are we trying to accomplish, right? So, so again, you've got to have all this stuff answered on your website and it has to be so flipping easy to get to that my, you know, nine-year-old could go and find all the answers, okay? So, so that's step one. Step two is where do your people live? Where do your audience live, right? So I had a client who, very interesting, they develop and then lease out student housing at like some of the biggest universities in the United States, right? You're like UT, University of Georgia, all that stuff. And they were huge, they ask you answer folks. And so they were doing all of the videos. They were answering the big five in video format on TikTok. That was their jam because their target audience for their buildings were sorority girls in their sophomore and junior year of school. Very targeted demographic they were looking for. And that's where those folks lived. So they were the first folks that I've ever worked with that were doing cost and price videos in a TikTok format. Right? Because... So again, if, so that's an example. Now, if the other example is all your folks live in LinkedIn, LinkedIn's a great channel. If all your folks lived in microfiche in the libraries then figure out how to get your stuff on newspapers and put in there and, you know, like know where your folks are at is going to help you know where you got to go. All of that comes after putting that stuff on your website because when somebody goes, to their phone, like we know that we all do, we want them to find us. All right, that's a great question, Martin. I loved it. Y'all listen, it has been a blast getting to talk to you about this stuff. There is tons of information out there. Here's the deal. We do this every month. Some months, most of the months, I think it'll be me. The other months, it's going to be my homeboy, Zach Basner, who's actually much smarter than me. Um, and this is recorded, so he's going to see that, which is not fun. I just realized that. But uh, Zach's brilliant. He's helped more businesses. He knows this stuff, just like, you know, Marcus and all of our other coaches. And here's the deal. We want you all to succeed. If for no other reason than I, when I have a decision that I need to make, or I have a question, I want to go to a website that actually flip and answers the question and helps me make a buying decision. And so if I can help coach and train businesses to do that, I won't have a shitty buying experience. So it's a very selfish reason that I want y'all to be really good at this. So go get after it. Have a great rest of your week. Have a great rest of this year. And we look forward to seeing y'all in January.